Welcome back once again to Mises Weekends. I'm your host, Jeff Deist, and we're continuing our series featuring some of the young scholars here at the Mises Institute acting as summer fellows. And this weekend, we're talking to Lukasz Dominiak, who is an adjunct scholar at Copernicus University in Poland. And this summer, as he studies and researches with us, he's focusing on the works of Hans Hermann Hoppe and some of the cultural aspects of a libertarian legal system. Lucas and I also discuss the tension between liberty and free immigration in supposedly democratic states where we have arbitrary national borders instead of hoppy and private property boundaries. And as a result, this clouds the issue of immigration for libertarians. And we wrap up our conversation talking about Hoppe's concept of private defense, where protection against invaders would be more a function of collective agreements and insurance arrangements than armies. So if you're interested in Hoppe, private law, and the role of culture in libertarian theory, stay tuned for a great interview with Lucas Dominiak. Lucas Dominiak, welcome to Mises Weekends. Thank you for having me. So more importantly, welcome to the Mises Institute. We're very happy and pleased and grateful that you chose to spend your summer with us. Um, for starters, why don't you tell us a little bit about how you came to be interested in Austrian economics and the Mises Institute? Uh, right. So actually, uh, I think the interesting thing is that my background is not uh, economics, it's uh, political philosophy. So uh, I somehow come from political philosophy, and I'm still within the uh, remit of political philosophy, more than economics. And uh, I think I basically studying political philosophy, you just uh, get acquainted with libertarianism. This is one of the most important contemporary political philosophies. And uh, but uh, I would say, like within this uh, mainstream political philosophy, you usually encounter uh, Robert Nozick. Libertarianism, particularly his uh, book uh, *Anarchy, State, and Utopia*, which is somehow different uh, from uh, what we have uh, within the Rothbardian, Hoppian uh, libertarianism. I think this is these are two different approaches towards the problem of uh, liberty and and uh, private property. So basically, uh, I got acquainted with uh, Robert Nozick uh, quite early in my career as a political philosopher and i wasn't really at that time uh, uh captivated by his approach i was working within classical tradition i would say like aristotle aquinas and contemporary uh representatives of this tradition and so basically uh, my phd was about communitarianism this is uh, uh mainly anglophone uh philosophy concerned with the concept of uh community and how an individual operates within different uh, communities. And uh, But later on, I read uh, Hobbes' book, Democracy, The God That Failed, and uh, it really captivated me. I think like his arguments are uh, really strong, arguments against statism, and I found particularly interesting arguments against uh, democracy. My boss uh, at university is a monarchist, so I had some like natural inclination towards anti-democratic political views, and yeah, it somehow found uh, interesting expressions uh, in Hoppus. So, what is your particular line of research that you're working on this summer? Yeah, this summer I'm working on a project that, uh, in one sense, I would, I would call it a connection between anarcho-capitalism on a political and economic level with uh, cultural conservatism. But I think that uh, to understand this project, we should look a little bit into background of it. So I think that libertarianism, particularly in this Rothbardian, Hoppian tradition, uh, is a quite narrow or thin political philosophy. It means that libertarianism is concerned mainly with, with one question, what are justified and unjustified ways of using violence? And because it starts from uh, two main axioms as a political philosophy, uh, which is uh, an axiom of self-ownership and uh, principle of non-aggression, it answers these questions in the, in the following way. So anything that is against these two principles, anything that violates these two principles, is considered uh, unjustified use of violence. And anything that uh, defends these two principles is 
considered justified use of violence. And there's a third, I think, part in this understanding of libertarianism, that anything that does not follow into uh, these two categories is left for individual choice. So in this sense, libertarianism is a thin political philosophy because other political philosophies usually consider the question of a good life uh, as a political matter. So for example, how uh, people should behave morally is also considered a question for uh, state power, legal issues, law, legislation, and so on and so forth. Libertarianism in this sense is a thin philosophy. But it raises a question, I believe, because uh, libertarianism is somehow mute on these problems, which, which can be called moral or cultural. Then the question is, what would be uh, the mm, cultural tissue of an anarcho-capitalist society? What would be the moral code of such a society? And basically, uh, I'm trying to tackle this question, and uh, my answer, at least tentatively, is that this moral code and cultural tissue would be conservative. So if we accept the view that political libertarianism is a thin philosophy, it's just a philosophy on what the state should not do, um, it sounds like what you're saying is the culture that arises in this political arrangement is one that stands or falls on its own merits. It's not state-directed. Yeah, that, that's true. I, and I believe that there are many arguments that can uh, show why libertarian society would be a conservative society. So, of course, there are reasons that we can say are direct that show that society would be conservative. So, for example, we know that libertarianism is a political philosophy that is in favor of private property. And we know that what we consider as a uh, conservative moral code, we don't have time probably to define conservatism here, but more or less we can say that Christian morality is what is meant by conservative morality, usually. And if we take, for example, the seventh commandment that, that say, thou shalt, shalt not steal, then we know that libertarianism is, of course, directly in favor of this uh, moral commandment, and that statism is a is against it that uh, taxation in any kind of form, for example, state created legislation or, or state created uh, inflation, uh, is stealing, basically. So that there's a, like a, there are some direct ways in which libertarianism promotes conservatism, but there are also other ways. For, for example, I believe that uh, a lot of moral turmoil that we experience these days is caused by somehow elevating to the rank of public problems uh, behaviors and issues that uh, have been with us from the dawn of time, but always confined to the private sphere. And now they somehow elevate to the rank of public problems. And because such uh, institutions as mainly state, uh, public health service, social security, uh, even marriages, they would be privatized. Then all these problems as public issues would disappear immediately in an anarcho-capitalist society. But I, I believe also that there are some more, more sophisticated arguments that show that uh, libertarianism would be conducive to cultural conservatism. But one of these arguments that I'm working on is an argument that is based on so-called frequency theory of uh, probability, developed by Richard von Mises and then uh, refined by Ludwig von Mises, his brother. And this theory basically says that uh, for um, a probability of a given event, this particular event has to be a part of a class of events in such a way that we don't know anything about this event except that it's a, a part of the class of these events. Uh, so basically for an uh, insurance company to estimate probability and therefore to calculate premiums, insurance premiums, a particular risk or particular event has to be of this sort, which is an event of a particular class of events. And obviously, as far as human, human actions are concerned, we know that human actions, uh, some intentional behaviors, are not this kind of events. Because at least a human actor knows something more about particular action of, of, of his than this action is a, a member of a class of actions of this type. He knows that this action is actually a matter of his decision, his free choice. So, uh, in a word, 
uh, basically it's impossible to insure yourself against your own actions. And uh, it would be impossible for insurance companies, if they wanted to insure this kind of intentional behaviors, to calculate proper insurance premiums. It means that a plethora of behaviors uh, that uh, these days are insured against through state wouldn't be insurable behaviors, insurable risks. And if costs rise, then probably the occurrence of a particular behavior would decrease. Well, it's interesting because it sounds to me like your thesis is that libertinism would actually be less common in a libertarian society because the individual would bear more of the direct costs of his or her lifestyle choices. Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree with, with this. And I think that would be the case. We know historically that uh, libertarianism was connected or was interpreted as promoting uh, nihilism or libertinism. But I believe it's not the case. It's exactly the opposite. Like libertarianism is a political philosophy, a political economic order that promotes conservative uh, order. Well, you've studied Hoppe at length. Could you give us a a reasonably concise definition of what Hoppe would conceive of as a as a private law society? What that might look like? I think that private law society uh, would be based on. Uh, obviously on the concept of private property and the concept of contract. So any kind of contracts that uh, uh, freely acting individuals would, uh, would make would be valid. And any viol violation of these contracts, uh, any violation of private property rights would be punished in a private law society. Private law society, as far as I understand it, is also a society in which everyone is governed by the same law. And we know that it's not the case these days, uh, that in uh, Western democracies we are governed by two different laws, private law and public law, and that these two different laws uh, make us unequal before the law. So in a private law society, we would have a situation in which people would be equal before the one law, and uh, this law wouldn't be considered a matter of legislation, that would be considered rather a moral or legal code that exists uh, and is probably developed on the, in an evolutionary way that couldn't be enacted by some body like parliament or any any other this kind of political entity, of course. And I believe uh, that private law society, when we switch our focus from uh, this legal question about private property and uh, how how would it work and and how would uh, contracts work into the question of uh, culture, that private law society would be a society in which uh, we would have much less what is these days called tolerance and much more what is these days called and uh, derided as uh, discrimination. So talking about culture and talking about Hoppe, he here's the irony that I would suggest is that in both a libertarian or private law model and in a socialist or status model, both of these tend to work better in socially cohesive, high trust societies. But it seems like the, the project in Europe is going in completely the opposite direction. It's a centralized status system under the Euro, which is based on multiculturalism. So well, what would a more Hoppian Europe look like, for example? I agree with what you said about uh, the current European project, that it's uh, multicultural and uh, somehow based on forced integration, a uh, political uh, project. And I think that uh, Hopian Europe would look like, more like, uh, actually that this is what he says in, in, in many places, that at least this, uh, let's say, transitory uh, stage of uh, coming from uh, status society to uh, purely private law society uh, should look like uh, a Europe of 10,000 Liechtensteins, uh, which is small political entities that would be, by the very fact of being small, forced to be liberal, to free trade with each other, and uh, that would be under constant pressure of uh, their citizens voting with their feet. So that would provide this natural pressure for these entities to be to be liberal, and the process of uh, seceding 
from uh, from a bigger entity to smaller entity would continue up to the level of uh, particular communities. So Hopian vision of uh, Europe would be exactly the opposite of what is going on these days in Europe as far as European Union is concerned. Because as you said, European Union is a project of centralized uh, government where power is taken even from the level of nation states, it's taken from at the level of nation states and given to uh, the central European Union bureaucrats. As far as the second problem mentioned by you is concerned, which is a uh, problem of multiculturalism, I believe that uh, private law society and the very concept of private law presupposes uh, discrimination or presupposes power to discriminate because uh, to be a, an owner of private property means that I'm the exclusive owner, I'm the, ex- I'm, I'm the only person that can decide how this property can be used and no one is allowed to interfere with my decision. So basically I, I think it means that first of all all these uh, uh, pressures that exist these days in uh, Western world and in European Union in particular I believe that force people to use their private property in a way they are not willing to use, of course, would disappear in a private law society. Let's talk about immigration. A very touchy subject for libertarians. On the one hand, we believe in self-determination. We want individuals to travel and live their lives as they see fit. And most of us don't want national borders, state derived national borders to begin with. But there's a very strong hoppy and a private property element involved in the movement of individuals uh, from point A to point B. So uh, what might immigration look like in a more hoppy society? First of all, I think that we believe that political borders are arbitrary and that borders of private property are objective and uh, natural. So as far as immigration is concerned, uh, as far as immigration is a matter of political decision, there is always a problem of trespassing natural borders. At the same time, trespassing of natural borders is interpreted in the political language as a uh, free immigration. It's free immigration as far as national political borders are concerned, but as far as national and political borders are unnatural borders, are arbitrary borders, they're always somehow in conflict with uh, private property borders. So I, so I believe that that's a problem of, uh, of uh, so-called free immigration. There is, I think, quite good argument given by Hopper was the difference between free trade and free immigration. So free trade is a situation in which goods are um, uh, travel. Uh, but for for a good to travel, this good has to be invited. There, there has to be some purchaser that would like to purchase a good. Otherwise, th- this good will not travel over borders. With free, so-called free immigration is different because usually free immigration is not a matter of invitation, it's a matter of political decision. So in a way, people are invited to a country defined by the political borders, but they, do- they don't have to necessarily be invited at the same time to the natural borders of private property. Uh, so, so yeah, this is uh, as far as diagnosis of a, a, a current situation goes. I think like in a European uh, society, immigration would be immigration on invitation. Like invitation would be, would be the, the crucial thing in a private law society. If you're invited, then you can travel. Uh, if you're not invited, then any traveling would be actually a trespassing, would be an uh, invasion of private property. So invitation would be a necessary condition. And I think that people would invite other people if they can contribute some, something to their lives and their prosperity, and their culture, knowledge, and so on and so forth. So no discussion of HAPA would be complete without talking about so-called national defense. If we had a a series of smaller, independent private law societies, 10,000 Liechtensteins, as you put it earlier, uh, throughout Europe, how would they collectively uh, defend themselves against, let's say, other states that were not private, uh, like the much vaunted threat from Russia? How would, in a Hoppian society, Poland and the Baltic states and the Scandinavian states, for example, uh, provide themselves with some kind of defense against aggressors? Right. So, so maybe b- before answering this main question, uh, some remark about this uh, haunted fear 
Putin of, of Russia. I think that <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, this is interesting because not uh, my view, but the mainstream view. Yeah, that's the mainstream view. It's not necessarily the case if you look at at the problem of a conflict in the Ukraine. It's it's more complicated. I and I think that European Union had a uh, some role in starting this this conflict as well, not only Russia, but. Uh, coming back to the to the main question, I believe that it's it's not so easy actually to invade a foreign country for say I don't know for Russia or for some some other state. First of all, even authoritarian or totalitarian regimes they depend domestically on the opinion of uh, the subjects. So basically, there must be some way of persuading people that give this uh, legitimacy to a political power, that a particular invasion is justified. So first of all, there must be some way of justification of invasion, which is not always so easy. And I think it's particularly not easy if invasion is an invasion uh, against a free society. So a free society is not a society in which we have dictatorship, in which we have uh, genocide, in which we have some other reasons that could, that could justify invasion. So that would be the first barrier, I believe, the first problem that would a uh, dictator would encounter if he wanted to invite free society. And the second problem, I believe, he would uh, he would face would be basically um, a problem with somehow fighting with insurance agencies, insurance companies, because uh, in a free society, private protection would be provided by probably provided by insurance companies. Insurance companies are usually international companies, multinational companies, uh, really powerful economically, and uh, they are not so easy uh, to fight against. And they wouldn't be so easy to find against, fight against in a free society in which they would provide also protection and defense for uh, private property owners. So that would be the second problem, I believe, that uh, this dictator or, or, or statist that would like to invade a free society uh, would have to face. And I believe that would be the third problem as well. A uh, free society would be generally armed society. People that, that are armed are difficult to fight against because... Contemporary war is a war when two armies fight against each other. On the one hand, it's true that this uh, distinction between combatants and non-combatants is blurred these days because of the, uh, because of the democracy and welfare state and so forth, so, so on and so forth. But still, this uh, invader, this uh, army invading free society, would have to fight with each particular property owner. So we could say that. Every citizen of free society would be a threat for an army invading. Uh, so again, we know from history that it's not so easy to fight against a society that is utterly against the invader. So we know about Vietnam, we know about uh, Afghanistan. It's really difficult to win against this entity. Well, as a Japanese general was purported to have said during World War II about America, a rifle behind every blade of grass. And with that, Lucas Dominiak, thank you so much for a fascinating interview. And ladies and gentlemen, have a great weekend.